thank everybody for showing up tonight for this lecture. This uh, lecture is about some of Birmingham's earliest neighborhoods and the development of Birmingham as we know it. My name is George Getchman. I'm a member of the board of the Friends of the Birmingham Museum. Our function is to support the museum. We, we do programming, um, manual labor, anything to support the museum. Um, Pam DeWeese will be doing the second half of the program. Pam is a member of the Baldwin Library Board, and Pam and I have worked together for a number of years on Greenwood Cemetery tours. We do these twice a year through the Friends of the Birmingham Museum. One of the nice things about being on the Friends Board of the Museum is that if you love history, you get lots of chances to do research and delve into interesting topics. So we're going to, there are many neighborhoods in Birmingham, obviously. We can't talk about all of them. We're going to talk about some of the earliest neighborhoods, at least some of the uh, earliest additions from the central village area of Birmingham. This shows the areas we're going to be working on. Uh, to the north, uh, I will be talking about the Holy Name neighborhood and also the Residence Park neighborhood, which has become more known as Little San Francisco in modern times. I'm going to also talk a little bit about Birmingham Villas over uh, by Adams Road and Maple. Pam is going to be talking about Court and Lake Estate, states uh, to the west of Court and Lake. And she's also going to be talking about Eco City south of Lincoln and west of Woodward. This is a bird's eye view of Birmingham in 1881. And if you look at the the road that goes straight across, the, it, that is uh, Woodward. We now call that Old Woodward. In its day, it was called Saginaw Street because it went from Detroit all the way up to Saginaw. And then going diagonally from the bottom left to the upper right is Maple. Back then, it was called Mill Street because of the mill that was beyond Southfield Road where the dam is now. The road that goes up to the upper left is Pierce Street. Uh, and then you notice the railroad tracks towards the bottom. That is now Woodward Avenue. Uh, Woodward, the railroad tracks went around uh, town. There was a depot at Maple, uh, right where the tracks crossed the road there. But you want to notice, uh, if you stood in the center of town, which is about Pierce and Maple, in any direction, you just had to go a few blocks, and you were out in the country, and you were in the farms. Birmingham was the center of a big farming uh, community in the Civil War. Oakland County led the Union in wool production. And so we're, gonna, we're standing right now on Southfield Road looking west. Uh, you can see Maple to the right. And we're going to go back in time to about the, the 1900 or so. And if you were standing there then, this is what you'd see. We'd see just farmland. To the right, you can see the mill, that, and to the right of that, you can see that white area is the dam. And um, Mill Street, or Maple, went on west, but this was all farmland. This is an undated picture to the south of Birmingham. This is Woodward. You know, it, we know this is be was taken before 1916 because Woodward wasn't paved yet. Woodward was paved in 1916. To the left of Woodward were railroad tracks uh, for the, the train and also the Detroit United Railroad, the trolley cars that went from Detroit to Pontiac and farther north. Um, we'll get into more of the interurban cars later. And now we're on Adams Road looking north. You can see the traffic signals at Maple and Adams. We're looking at Villa Street. And if we go back about 120 years ago, this is what that looked like. So this is Adams Road, just a little single lane road. And this was the Miller Farm with their big cow barn. Where the trees are to the left, that was the intersection of Maple and Adams. So in 1890, Birmingham began to be discovered. This was an article that, it, that was in the Detroit Evening Journal in May of 1891. And it, talks about Birmingham. It says, Detroit capitalists are buying up this whole vicinity. Uh, several other Detroiters see that the city needs suburban advantages, and they'll plant the land within the near future and make great effort to attract settlers. And then a week later, in, in oh, and this is the same paper, but it's 
I love this line. They were talking about the advantage that Birmingham has. Uh, it has delightful air and a mortality record that will compare favorably with any section of the country. So if you lived in the Birmingham area, you're likely to live longer, according to them. And then a week later in the Birmingham eccentric, they must have noticed that article in the Detroit paper because they mentioned that the real estate men of the big wicked city have opened their eyes to the advantages which we can offer and are filling the highways and byways with their active bids for acreage in the vicinity of the village. So if we look at Birmingham's population, we see that it was pretty static in the last few decades of the 1800s, and then beginning in 1900, 1910, it begins to grow, kind of coordinates with the growth of the city of Detroit. Between 1910 and 1920, the, the population of Birmingham doubled and then tripled to 1930. This is, of course, because of the automotive um, industry catching on in Detroit, population increased, and Detroiters were looking for rural places to, to live. So here's the advent of the automobile. This picture was taken around 1905. This is Woodward looking north towards Long Lake Road, which you can barely see in the center of the picture, a little white line, that's Long Lake. To the right in the field, that's where the Little Daddy's restaurant is now, and Joe Muir's restaurant would be to the left in that field right now. And you can notice the railroad tracks and the DUR line running up right alongside one lane Woodward Avenue. And so in Detroit, between 1900 and 1920, there were about 85 startups of automotive companies. So that, of course, that brought in a lot of workers, a lot of engineers, a lot of executives. And in general, the workers tended to live closer to where they worked, but the engineers and executives were, were willing to live farther away. Uh, Bloomfield Township was an ideal location because of the lakes, the rolling hills, the countryside, and that attracted a lot of uh, wealthy individuals, such as the Booths, uh, who started Cranbrook. And here is the interurban car. This was a car that went through Birmingham and it was, a, it was readily available to, for commuters to go from the city out to the suburbs or the outlying communities. If we were to, the, this spot right now is right here on North Old Woodward Avenue. This is in the center of town on Wood, Old Woodward now. This is the DUR waiting room. You can see people out in front waiting for the DUR line. You can see the tracks right down the middle of, of Old Woodward. Uh, the, the intersection of Woodward and Maple is just to the far right of the picture. And uh, this is the modern view of that. The, the DUR was located just beyond where that parked car is, where the, the building with the black facade is. The whitish building next to that was Levinson's department store, which came in, in the, uh, later, a little bit later on. This shows the schedule of the DUR. It was very convenient. You could, you could hop on the DUR there at, at, the, uh, at about Harmon in Old Woodward, or you could get it at the DUR waiting room in Birmingham. Every half hour during rush hour, uh, I believe it cost 10 cents to get into Detroit, and it would whisk you down uh, pretty quickly. Another advantage that Birmingham had starting in 1890 was Birmingham had waterworks, so people in the village had access to city water. The, this waterworks was in the south side of Maple, uh, right near uh, where the dam is, where the Rouge River crosses. They, they had a well. They pumped water from the well into a holding tank and then pumped that through lines into the city. The, the uh, waterworks operated during daytime until 1899 when it operated 24 hours a day. So this was a big advantage for uh, newcomers seeking a place to live in Birmingham. This is a map of the original land holdings in Birmingham. Uh, the original land holders, there's a picture of Elijah Willits. He owned the area north of Maple um, and kind of west of a line north of Pierce Street. And John Hamilton owned Sector B. John uh, West Hunter owned Sector D. And Benjamin Pierce owned Section C. Benjamin Pierce was the brother of, of uh, soon to be President Franklin Pierce. Uh, Benjamin Pierce was the only one who did not settle in Birmingham. The others did, and, but 
the neighborhood that I'm going to be talking about today is largely in Elijah Willett's land to the northwest. This is a plat map from um, 1872. And you can see the Saginaw Street, which is now Old Woodward. You can see the cemetery at the top. That the road that went to, to the cemetery, it was not Oak Street then, it was called Cemetery Road. And Harmon Street there is in the middle. And you note know the River Rouge was misspelled. They call it the River Rogue. That was, a, that was an editing error. And Mill Street in town is, is now Maple. The names are the landholders. These are descendants of the Willets, basically. The, the Willets, the Lees, and the Hunts. And they own this area uh, in, until about the beginning of the 1890s. So here are two more plat maps. The map on the left is a plat map from 1896. And again, it showed up at the upper left is the Willets edition. Uh, the center is the original town, and you'll notice the different colored little plats around. These are various additions that are beginning to occur in the 1890s of local people purchasing land from the descendants of the earliest owners, and they began to plat out streets and, and plats of land, and the village was beginning to grow. The plat map on the right is from 1908, and again, the, the main area that we're going to be concerned with in my talk is north of Maple, around Woodward Avenue, North Old Woodward Avenue. And you can see in this that, that some of these areas are beginning to be platted out a little bit more specifically. So if we're going to, the, the area in, I'm going to give you an idea of what that area looked like around uh, that time as the 1890s to 1900. We're now standing on North Old Woodward at, at Harmon Street, looking at Harmon Park. We're looking west. And this is what it looked like around the turn of the century, around 1900. Not very appealing, is it? This is the DUR power plant. This is where it powered, it generated electricity for the, the DUR line. The, uh, also, it was a car barn to the right. Uh, in the foreground, you can see uh, Woodward, at Old. Old Woodward, um, which was then called Saginaw Street. Uh, the p little hill between the, the road and the power plant is not a pleasant little hill. That's just a big pile of coal, which they used to power the plant. It was kind of a dirty area. And so now we're standing on the west side of North Old Wo Woodward, looking north toward Harmon Street. You can see Salvatore Scalapini there. And we're going to jump back to about 1905 at the same site. and. So there is the street then. Uh, the, a couple of kids are standing on the wooden walkway, the wooden sidewalk. You notice north of Harmon Street, that white line, that's, those are cement sidewalks. To the right are, is the DUR line, which ran all the way up to Pontiac and beyond. And now we're standing in the center of North Old Woodward, looking north. But again, back in around 1905, this is what that looked like. The big house on the left was the house owned by Emma Robinson. She lived in Birmingham her entire life. Uh, she grew up actually in the house that has recently been renovated on North Maple, um, just across from the, uh, the parking structure. So this is the plat map, a little closer view of the plat map from 1908. And the first thing we want to look at is the Cor Corson edition. Uh, which is the small whitish area um, to the north. Um, there is Vinewood Street. Vinewood was one of the first streets beyond uh, Harmon Street that was, was platted. So uh, J.R. Corson uh, platted seven lots in that area. J.R. Corson uh, and is a father-son. They uh, owned a dry goods store in Birmingham. They were quite pros prosperous and they purchased land from the Willits descendants and attempted to do a, make a little development um, right where Vinewood Street is. The Corson family, um, there were oh, three or four generations that lived here. They, uh, Harold Corson was, a, was during the uh, World War II, was actually the city manager of Birmingham. He was also the city engineer, and he had two sons that grew up in Birmingham and were World War II veterans. So that family went back and extended a long time. 
So we're standing now at Vinewood and North Old Woodward. So this land um, to the south and to the west on Vinewood Street was part of the Corson addition. None of the houses were original. In fact, the Corsons never really saw any houses built. They, they probably put the road in, planted the land, maybe put sidewalks in, but nothing really was built. This is an ad that appeared in the Birmingham Eccentric in August of 1899, which advises people that you can purchase um, a plot in this course in addition from as little as $125, but up until that time, only one lot had sold. So going elsewhere in this area, um, there's Harmon Street right in the center, and to the south of Harmon is the Baldwin and Shattuck edition. So we can't do a lecture about Birmingham without including Martha Baldwin, it seems. Uh, Martha invested in land here, and she and a man named Nelson Shattuck, who is also a Birmingham resident, they purchased some land and they platted it uh, to develop. And this was the road that they platted, Bonnie Briar. I'm not sure, but it may be that Martha is the one who gave Bonnie Briar its name. However, the, the road, as when they owned it, I don't think the road was built. Uh, the houses were never built. They wound up selling the, the um, land to a Mr. Bunting from Detroit, who built a house on Harmon Street and lived there uh, for a number of years. And then he eventually sold it. And then the uh, land was uh, finally divided and developed. So again, the same area just north of Maple, just east of Court and Lake. The yellow area down at the bottom is the Whitehead and Mitchell edition. And then north of that was the Randall edition. So Whitehead and Mitchell, uh, George Mitchell is standing the second from the left on the top, and Almeron Whitehead is in the center on the, in the bottom row, and the two Randalls are on the end of the bottom row. Um, Whitehead and Mitchell uh, came to Birmingham uh, quite young. They uh, were fixtures in Birmingham their entire life. They were involved with many or, uh, activities. They had many businesses. Um, this is right in the center of the addition. And this, I believe, is Baldwin Court. And this is part of their addition. Um, again, they platted it and um, sold houses. You could, in the, in the Randall addition, which uh, was adjacent to this, you could buy two plots of land for $125. So Whitehead and Mitchell, we all know, they started the eccentric. They founded that in the 1870s. They owned a dry goods store. You could buy bicycles there. Uh, they, they sold groceries. Uh, they sold furniture. They owned a bank. Basically, in those days, if you had a safe, you could, you could operate a bank. Uh, and also, they had a real estate exchange. So you, they, you could come to them and purchase, purchase property, houses, or land. They would finance you. So uh, the Whitehead and Mitchell um, also got into uh, development, too. So Birmingham's Heights subdivision uh, was developed beginning around 1913. And here is a little close-up of its plat. Notice Oak Street at the top. Woodland goes straight down the center of it. Uh, Greenwood is the border on the left, and Harmon Street on the right. And notice how large the plats are. They expected some very large houses, apparently. And they used their eccentric newspaper to really pump up the, uh, the uh, interest in people purchasing it. They are, they're always trying to get people in Birmingham to buy up land before they're they trying to impress upon people that of Birmingham that Detroiters were going to come up and snatch these plots up before um, they could get them, so hurry up and buy them. Anyway, this is on Oak Street. This is, uh, I believe, one of the original houses in the Birmingham Heights subdivision. And this is uh, also an original house at Greenwood and Oak with the fencing around it that we're all familiar with, and this house will not be surviving much longer. And so here's another article that appeared in 1913 in The Eccentric. Lots of trouble, lots of joy, lots of chances for strife. 
by a lot in Birmingham Heights and be happy all your life. And again, young man, if you can scrape up $100, why don't you buy a lot in Birmingham Heights? The 100 will do it, and the balance can be paid in easily monthly payments. And so here is Holy Name Church, which uh, in, was uh, begun, the original church, which was begun in the 1920s. And so around 1913, there were other improvements coming to Birmingham. And we have a long, young lady here standing on East Maple. Uh, this would be in October of 1913, because in that month, sewer crocs were delivered to Birmingham, and they decided to put in sewers, which was another important development, because other, before that, people had to rely on outhouses. At that time, there really was no wastewater treatment. The sewers probably just went to the Rouge River and diverted the sewage there. They, there was some talk at the time. Uh, behind her is Adams Road. Um, at the top of the picture, there was talk of putting a sewage lagoon on Adams Road at that time, which perhaps fortunately didn't happen. And here's about where that picture was taken in 1913. So now we're going to move across the street of, on Old Woodward. We're going to be on the east side of Old Woodward to the little San Francisco area. And here is a bir recent bird's eye map, uh, uh, aerial view map of that area. So basically, we're going to be talking now about the area north of Oakland and west of Woodward, east of North Old Woodward, and south of Oak Street. So this is the Oak Grove edition. And this, again, was a plot of land. It was purchased from descendants of the, of the Willets by some local uh, businessmen. And you can see th this basically map is facing east, sort of. There's Oakland on the right, Euclid and Park. At the top of the map were the railroad tracks. At the bottom of the map was Woodward, now Old Woodward. These were the uh, men who uh, invested in this land and were developing. Uh, uh, Rundell was a real estate man. Uh, D.M. Johnston was a dentist. His office was above uh, the, where Panera Bread is now. Frank Hagerman was a pharmacist, and Mr. Cobb was also a pharmacist. And the other signatures are their wives. This is the only picture I have of James Cobb. He also was the uh, fire chief of the Birmingham Volunteer Fire Department. So this is a plat map of the area. Uh, this was a plat map from about 1920. You can see the DUR still runs down North Old Woodward at that time. Uh, the, the land is, is pretty well platted, and they call it the Oak Grove Edition. This is a Stanford map, which was used for insurance purposes, which showed the uh, materials of the structures in the area. Basically, yellow was frame, uh, pink was brick, and you can see it. This is early 1920s, how this area is developing. So this is at the corner, the southwest corner of Euclid and, oh, let's see, Euclid and Ferndale. And this is the current house, much changed, but basically the same. And this is across the street, the northwest corner of Euclid and Ferndale. And this is where that house was. And this is the house that was across the kitty corner across the street from that one, same, same intersection. So this is a true craftsman house. They called these bungalows back then. I don't know if any of you ever watch uh, House Hunters. People are always calling houses craftsmen, which are not craftsmen. This is a craftsman house. We have a, still have a lot of those in Birmingham. This is at the southeast corner of Euclid and North Old Woodward. This was the first Presbyterian church in a relatively new building in the early 1900s. And that's where it was. This is the current view. And so this is looking the other way down. This is at Oakland Avenue and North Old Woodward looking northeast. This is part of, was part of the Oak Grove addition. And if we went back in time, you can see there were residences all along North Old Woodward 
they were, that were part of that subdivision. And again, this is a, another view of the same area that you get a little bit better. This is an earlier view, obviously, because the trees aren't as mature. You can actually see the houses. So these were some of the, the styles of houses that, that were part of that addition. So this is a bird's eye view map that was generated in 1915. Uh, Judson Bradway was a local, he grew up on a farm south of Birmingham. He was a local who became a real estate developer. And uh, many of you know of, of Bradway Street, which is in uh, Broomfield Village. That was uh, one of his uh, developments of the Hub Farm. But in 1915, he commissioned a watercolor bird's eye view to be done of Bloomfield Township. The original of this work is now in the Bloomfield Township uh, Auditorium. And this is just a small section that was forwarded to me by John Marshall, who's very active in the, the Bloomfield Hills Historical Society. So this shows at the bottom right the Oak Grove edition. Uh, the, you can still see the, do, the uh, DUR uh, power plant, which is at Harmon and North Old Woodward. This is in 1915, that was still there. And you see all the woods across the street. And that was um, at the time, um, before about from about 1900 to 1910, an area which they called Electric Park, one of two parks that existed in Birmingham. Uh, Baldwin Park at Maple and Southfield was one that was city owned. This one was privately owned. It was actually owned by the same men who developed the Oak Grove edition. And, uh, and eventually uh, this area became uh, another uh, subdivision known as Residence Park, which began in 1915. So the area that we're gonna be talking about here is the area basically north of Euclid between Woodward and Old Woodward up to Oak Street. Again, this is the 1920-ish plat map. So now we're on North Old Woodward at Harmon Park looking east. This is uh, Ravine, yeah, Ravine Street, and we're looking into what was the entrance to Electric Park. Electric Park was very popular in that decade between 1900 and 1910. It was called Electric Park because the DUR power plant supplied electricity to lights that were strung out that were hung among the trees in this park. It was very popular. People came down from Pontiac or came up from Royal Oak and would spend the entire day there. And uh, I, this shows a little bit closer of the area of Electric Park. There was a trail, that circular trail that went through. There was a viaduct that the, the railroad went over. And here is a young woman. This I believe this is the daughter, daughter of Frank Hagerman, who was an artist. And she was attempting to paint the viaduct or the cow, who knows. And this is the same area. Uh, again, this is uh, in the residence park area where the, the viaduct is or was is now uh, north is now Woodward Avenue. So Charles Jones was a uh, man who was not born in Birmingham, but he moved here and he became a developer. And he's the one who developed the residence park area, or he he actually uh, purchased. Uh, Electric Park from a woman who was a Detroiter. The, the four Birmingham men who owned it, they sold it to her. Um, she was expected to build a big estate on the site, but it never happened. And just a year or two later, Charles Edwin Jones purchased the land, and he, uh, this was a, a little poem that appeared in the eccentric in, in 1915. Now there is Charles Edwin Jones. For boosting, he's making no bones. For our hometown, they say, he shouts night and day. So bully for Charles Edward Jones. So this is a, the, a little closer up of the Sanford map from 1920s showing uh, the residence park uh, subdivision. So you can see some of the streets which are, were platted out. They were still there. They were based on trails that existed in Electric Park. And so this is the corner of Euclid and North Old Woodward. And one of the first homes in Residence Park was put here. And it was the Chambers Bungalow. So this was uh, Charles Edwin Jones had an architect. Um, his name was, um, oh, it was James, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. 
he was from Chicago, however. He uh, did a lot of uh, architecture there of North Chicago, and probably a lot of the homes that were um, that are put in here probably have homes that are very similar to them somewhere in North Chicago because they used a lot of his plans for that. You notice this house, there's a lot of brickwork, um, a lot of craftsman elements. Towards the back of the house, you see the two darker areas. This is a novel item for homes in that time. Uh, you had a, an attached structure. You would drive your automobile in there, so you'd actually park your automobile in your house. They had a heated garage, and this is a brand new concept in 1915. So this was one of the trails that went through Electric Park, which became Ravine. And again, on the right is one of the first of the four homes that was built in Residence Park on Ravine Road. And there is the house today looking very similar. Charles Jones, I just threw this in, he, for a brief period of time around World War I, owned the, the moving picture theater in town, which was um, on just down the street um, where the Palladium is now, kind of up the street a little bit from where the, this is. He only owned it for a year. Apparently, it was not a very good money-making venture. Birmingham people, he thought, after a while, were not the movie-going sorts of people, so he sold it. Again, looking at the Sanford map. Next, we're going to look at two houses on Brookside um, that were built right together pretty early on, around 1915. So we're, again, we're standing in the North Wood Old Woodward looking west. Of course, these uh, buildings built by Clarence Walker in the 1950s were not there then. And so we're going back to 1915 when these houses were built. Uh, you could, you, this picture was taken from Woodward, or now North Old, Old Woodward, looking at these houses during the winter of 1915 as they were being built, the one on the right and the one on the left. And we're going to look at the house on the right. This is as it looks today, pretty much unchanged. A little, the, the porch was extended. Uh, the dormers were put on since then. Uh, it, there was an article in the eccentric in March of 1915, I think, that there was a big to-do at this house. They, uh, Charles Joan took a bunch of uh, people through this house to show off what uh, he was building, some of the features it had. These houses were uh, considered very upscale. They had two bathrooms, well, one and a half bathrooms. They had a lavatory on the first floor and a full bath on the second floor, and both bathrooms were tiled. They also had sleeping porches, uh, this house had a, a porch called a dusting porch, whatever that was. And so this is its neighbor, this uh, Dutch colonial house, which pretty much is um, exactly like it looked um, about 1915. I'm sure the inside has been updated. And further down, this is Brookside Street, some of the original houses. These houses were all on uh, a ravine, so they often built garages into underneath the house, which was another novel feature. Charles Jones claimed that this was reminiscent of homes that were built in the Alps. And in this house, uh, you can see the double doors uh, the, on the lower um, right side of the house. I assume probably at one time was a garage door. And on Brookside Street, here is another house with a garage going into the basement. And uh, again, looking at the plat map from 1920s, uh, you can see on the north side how Rouge River splits into two. And in this area, this is where the farmer's market is. There's a, the parking lot number six uh, is there. And at that time in 1915, they brought a steam shovel up from Detroit. They uh, dug a second channel to the Rouge River and to create a little island. So you can see on the west side the artificial channel that was dug. Uh, the original channel is on the right side. They plotted, planned to put a road into the island. Uh, there was a, a road uh, just to the west of the new channel that was called Island View Drive, and they planned to put a cement bridge over the Rouge River on the, at the corners of this plot of land. And this is where the bridge would have gone, going down into the, uh, where the parking lot is now. This, uh, 
You have to take my word for it. This is a picture of the steam shovel in June of 1915 when it was digging out the second channel uh, in that area. So the channel, the second channel that they dug was, was dug approximately right in the aisleway between the, where these parked cars were. And the uh, original channel is way off to the left into the woods. And they plotted, actually were going, planning to put three houses in that island area. Didn't happen because it's a floodplain. Uh, so this is looking down North Old Woodward at Harmon Street, looking into town. This is Booth Park there. Yeah, so you can't have houses there. <laughs> so we're just going to spend a couple of minutes on Birmingham Villas. Birmingham Villas uh, was, again, plotted out about this time. Uh, this was done mostly by outsiders. This, uh, some investors in Detroit uh, purchased uh, and plotted this area, the southeast corner of Maple and Adams Road. Notice they plotted out two roads, Yosemite and Prairie Street. Of course, Prairie Street was renamed to Villa. And this was the Walker farmhouse, which survived the development. This is the original farmhouse. And that's the Walker farmhouse um, about the turn of the century, about 1900, before this land was developed. And this is looking to the northeast, the same farmhouse. And I want to take this opportunity to plug our cemetery tours. We have a tour in May, and we have a tour in September, usually. The May tour is about the uh, people who lived in Birmingham in the, in the 1900s. The fall tour is usually the earliest settlers. And here is Pat Andrews, who's a longtime um, participant in these cemetery tours. And uh, they're very interesting. We urge you to attend these. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Pam. OK. I guess I should start since we're already, you know, we're over a half hour already. But if you want to get coffee and stuff, just go for it. Do it. Don't feel like you can't. Um, okay, well, I am uh, taking us now a little fur later into the 20s, and this is when the big bad capitalists really came to Birmingham. So <laughs> we are going to look at the, the outsiders coming in and kind of the beginning of the change of Birmingham from a little village into um, something more modern and suburban. And uh, to do that, I'm going to look primarily at Court and Lakes Estates and Eco City, two um, sub places that were not in Birmingham. Most of the places you saw with George were within the Birmingham city limits. Now we're going to Bloomfield Township and two developments that later were annexed into Birmingham. Uh, so I'm going to start with... I just thought this was really interesting. This is the U.S. This is a map of home building from 1915 to 1969. And that's the number of homes built. And what you can see there, of course, is this huge jump around 1923. And that, that was what was happening here. And then it never gets that high again until after World War II, for a lot of reasons we're aware of. And then it goes down again. So it's pretty interesting. Um, D Detroit in 1923 was the fastest growing metropolitan area in the country. And 11,000 homes were built in 1923 between the borders of Detroit and a 12-mile radius, a 12-mile arc. Pretty amazing. So here's, this is a later map. This is where all the um, annexing shows when the different um, parts were annexed. But um, what am I? I wanted to use it to um, show you the areas I'll be talking about. Here's the main, main Birmingham. This is Court and Lakes over here. My hand's shaking like crazy. And down here is Eco City. OK. And um, this, the bird's eye map that George had, this is, the, is now at, at Township Hall, Bloomfield Township Hall. This is the part that reflects um, Court and Lakes Estates, which is where I'm going to start talking. 
The street on the far left is Chesterfield. Um, you can see Court and Lake, which was called the Mill Pond at the time. You can see Woodward angled up on the far right. Uh, and um, there is Oak, which doesn't go through yet, which was the Cemetery Drive right there, hasn't cut through. And there's a variety, of, there's a, quite a big farm development up at the top by Corton, the top road. And down at the bottom, the very bottom large road is Maple. And there's quite a large farm development there. And then there's some other farms scattered around. Um, that's what it looked like in 1915. So it was beautiful virgin farm territory. This is the Corton Farmhouse that was up on Corton Road owned by Thomas Corton and his wife, and they had a big sheep farm. Um, we're lucky. That house is very different now, but it's still there. Um, it's been changed considerably, but we've, we've still got it. It was built uh, in about 1837, um, so it's, yeah, the original house was very old by um, a person named... Um, um, it wasn't, what was his name? Oh, Alexander, I need my cheats, Duncan, Duncan. Um, okay, so the Cortons had that, and they had three sons, Fred, Edward, and Albert, and they raised sheep. And um, down at the bottom, the other big farm was the Stuart Watkins farm. It was a very big operation, had five barns, four houses for people to, for uh, workers to sleep in, three windmills, and a house. And this was an especially beloved uh, institution in Birmingham back in the 1880s uh, because it was the Shetland Pony Farm. Leslie had mentioned they're going to have a talk about the Shetland Ponies in Birmingham. Well, he had about, Mr. Watkins had about 150 Shetland Ponies that he raised here. And um, he took them around and got lots of awards for them at state fairs and things. But they were working ponies. And where they worked was the concessions at Bob Lowe and Belle Isle, where you would go and ride a pony. Uh, and so every spring, it was sort of a town, Birmingham town tradition. There would be a day when all the ponies would be herded down Woodward hard to believe, but you know, it wasn't paved yet, down Woodward to the water and ferried over to um, Bablo Island and Belle Isle. And Mr. Watkins had a, um, a, a relative, Fen Watkins, who was a real, uh, lived in Birmingham for, for many, many years and people, at least until, I don't know if anybody's still alive that remembers Fen, um, but Fen would live on Bablo for the summer and um, take care of the concession there. And he, he actually had, two of his children were born on Bablo Island, which is, you know, kind of amazing. Um, so anyway, this was the Stuart Watkins farm down at the bottom. We have the Corton farm at the top. These are the ponies. I had to have a picture of the ponies. This is the house. This is the Stuart Watkins house. This was how it looked. Uh, at some point, I don't have a date for it. Um, it doesn't look that different now. This is how it looks now. So, and it's one of our historic homes. Um, 1855. It's on the corner of Puritan and Maple. So around, um, the Cortons were farming and after Tom, Mr. Corton died, the boys farmed for a while. And then around 1906, Fred Corton moved down to this house, bought this and moved down here. So they were kind of consolidating. Uh, and he bought this area and lived here from about 1906 to 1915. And then that's when um, some of the uh, Detroit uh, capitalists, so to speak, were moving in and buying a lot of land. Um, because they saw real opportunities. And there was a group that was buying land around all the lakes, Cass Lake, Elizabeth Lake, all the big lakes. And they were buying, they wanted to buy this territory. And they bought 
160 acres from Fred for $60,000. And um, Fred actually uh, went on to be, he, he was an outstanding Birmingham citizen. He was on the school board, the city commission. Um, he was called a private philanthropist because he was the kind of guy that would take baskets of food to people's houses and things like that. And he built the Corton building downtown. And I think he built the Corton building in 1916 with the money he got from selling the land. So this was another old Birmingham landmark that no longer exists that was on that piece of land. And that was the mill. The mill was there from the 1830s until about 1917. And you can see the Pioneer Flower sign on there. Still, uh, we still have Pioneer Flower, but we don't have our mill anymore. And there was the mill race, and we have Mill Race Street to commemorate where that was, down at the bottom of, of the lake. And so this is a map that shows in 1916 the Corton Lake area without any, any houses on it. And then by 1920, we've got streets. So that was the transition between 1915 and 1920 when the streets were put in. Um, the capitalists from, from Detroit had come. And here's one of them. Joseph Mack. Um, there were three, Paul Gray, the Lumen Goodenow, and Joseph Mack. Kind of all got together. They were buying up this land. Um, but Joseph was really the spark for Quarton Lake because he wanted to live and, and have a vacation home right in this area at Quarton Lake Estates. And he envisioned it as his, as his summer home. And he envisioned Quarton Lake Estates as kind of a big summer resort where people from Detroit, affluent people, um, the businessmen, could have summer homes. And they could swim in the lake, and they could have a boathouse. It would be kind of a country club type thing. Um, and um, so he was, he was very involved. And the reality is, what he ended up doing um, was buying the Corton farmhouse and renovating it and living there. And in fact, there were Max living in the Corton Lake and at that farmhouse until the 1950s. Uh, but he spent his summers in the 20s there. So, um, and this was w where he made his money. He made his money on the printing business. This was his building in downtown Detroit. Um, and he did all the printing for the auto industry. Uh, Paul Gray, who was the other large investor, uh, was um, the largest real estate owner in Detroit at the time, and he got his money from the National Candy Company. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but the National Candy Company was apparently national and had hundreds of workers. Um, so, that's who they. Okay, now this, so I'm, I was looking through the eccentric for. Um, information about Court and Lake Estates going issue by issue. This is um, June 23rd, 1916. I come to that front page. This is the front page of the Birmingham Eccentric. Wow, June 23rd, 1916. The whole front page is um, a platted map of Court and Lake Estates. So uh, I'm talking about this beautiful Bloomfield subdivision. So I guess either um, they, uh, the real estate people bought the front page or Birmingham's editor, George Averill, was just so darn excited about the whole thing that he put it there anyway. Um, so this shows, this suggests that it was platted in 1916 um, with lots ready to buy for houses. But I kind of think this was the plan this was the plan that was drawn up to plat it. I think it was platted gradually between um, 16 and the next, the following years. Because one thing that we know, of course, is what, what happened in 1917? The war. So um, there, there weren't resources. There weren't materials. There weren't people. People weren't buying cars. Um, 
times were, were very different very quickly. So really, Court and Lake estates didn't get off the ground until the 1920s, after the war and after a recession. And then, as you remember in that building chart, around the mid-20s, things went kind of crazy. So, oh, and down here, the, these are the realtors, apparently, that the, the big Detroit investors were using. And Stormfelt's happens to be the realtor who built Adams Castle, if any of you know Adams Castle over in Troy. So he made, he'd made good on Quartin Lakes, because he built that in 1926, I think. So I'm figuring he used the money from selling, selling the plots over here <laughs> to do that. OK, here's an ad that was in the eccentric. You want to live on a paved road? Yeah, Court and Lake Estates. There's a couple of interesting things on here. One is it's clearly these are improved um, lots. So I mean, they had sewer pipes, water pipes ready to hook up with Birmingham or in the hopes that that would happen. Um, they had um, street lights, sidewalks, everything. Everything came with your, with your property. The other thing that's interesting is it says Birmingham's Indian Village. So who, are, who is their target audience? You know, we know who their target audience is. They want the businessmen, the professionals, um, Indian Village, I think most of you know, beautiful, beautiful homes over on the east side of Detroit. Um, so I, I kind of actually, in, in going through this, had the sense that back when Max started in 1915 and 16, the idea was more country homes, country resort, but you know, things were changing so fast, people were getting cars, the suburbs were growing that by the early 20s, it was much more thought of as a residential, permanent, or year-round residential community. Um, and they also were appealing to um, people in, in uh, Birmingham to buy lots to resell, you know, that this would be a great deal. And there were ads in the paper about that, buy your lots now and, you know, resell them and you, you'll do very well. So now this is 1925. Uh, so finally, now we have these are one, two, three, four, five houses that are that are being that have been built in Court and Lake Estates, and this was in the Afterglow magazine in 1925. By then, things were really, really going strong. In um, this is the Walsh House. Walsh was one of the real estate people. This is his house on Lake Park. It was built by Ferrer and Muehlman. Muehlman, Ferrer and Muehlman built the community house. They built the Baptist Church downtown. And they built a lot of the houses in Court and Lake Estates. And um, one of the things about those houses, this is the front and the back, is that there was a requirement that if your house was on the water, it had to really have two fronts. It had to look like a front in the front, and it had to look like a front facing the water. You couldn't have it look like an ordinary backyard. And that was the view of the water. It was Lake Park. And, 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 and in terms of showing before and afters for Court and Lakes, it's kind of hard because the houses that were there in the 20s that are still there look about the same. You know, um, or they're not there, one or the other, because they were built to last. And um, they were built by architects. They were built slowly over time, craftsmen, um, very different than Eco City that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. This is the house at a later time. Same house, a few different bushes. Um, I have the address, but I'm not, I have it written down somewhere. Yeah. Four houses north of Maple. Yeah. Okay, four houses north of Maple. Beautiful house. A lot of beautiful houses. Okay, this. This is a Wallace Frost house. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Wallace Frost, and there's at least 10 Wallace Frost houses in, um, 
in Court and Lakes Estates. He was a highly regarded architect. He worked with Scott Hersey, the builder, and um, his houses have very distinctive characteristics and people are pretty, pretty, who know Wallace Frost feel like they can, you know, pick them out. Um, but some of the things about the, and this one's on uh, Puritan, some of the things about the Wallace Frost houses are um, the very steep roof line that goes down to the first floor you know, and the very many um, window panes and the use of a lot of different materials, stucco, shingle, brick, all in one house, and a very complicated roof line. So all those things are kind of characteristic Wallace Frost. They always seem to, to me to have a very English look. You know, they're very, very English looking houses. And one of the things I did read is that they all have small kitchens because Wallace Frost hated to cook. So, yeah, yeah, it's small bathroom. So if you were gonna move into one of those, it's not an unmitigated blessing. But, um, and some of them have been torn down, is my understanding, but they're um, quite highly regarded. Okay. I want to get back to the map just to remind you again. Now I'm going to talk a little about Eco City so I can kind of compare and contrast the two a little. And that's right down, we're talking right down here. Grant is on the, Grant Street would be on the west side. And then it crosses Woodward. Eco City crosses Woodward and um, is on both sides of Woodward and goes over um, to Adams and up to Holland Street, north of Lincoln. But it's basically, when I think of it, I think of it as being south of Lincoln, north of 14, between Grant and to Woodward and over across Woodward, over to several blocks the other, the other side. And, and of course, what happened over time is that other subdivisions surrounded all these, these subdivisions, and so there's not sharp demarcations anymore. Okay, this is, there's Birmingham, there's Court and Lakes Estate, and this Stanley Farm down on the far right. That's pretty much where Eco started. It started as 100 acres. Um, and the people that purchased it were not unlike um, Gray and uh, Mac and Goodenow, except they were unlike them in that they were actually um, professional realtor developers. And that was kind of a new occupation in the 20s because unlike Court and Lake Estates where really what the investors were doing was buying property and reselling it for and, and putting in and platting it and putting in all the improvements and then reselling it for people to buy and hire then hire builders and architects to build beautiful homes for them. But what these realtor developers were doing was creating a subdivision where they encouraged people to buy not only lots, but houses. They had model houses and they, would, they wanted to build the houses for you. So their profits were coming from houses and lots. And the way they were doing that is applying um, industrial assembly line kind of techniques to building houses. So the architect got left out a bit and the craftsman and what you had maybe would, if you could have a group of houses that were the same because they were models and people had picked that model, well then people, they, you could have workers go around and do all the basements and then you could have another group of workers go around and um, do the, the, first, the floors and then another group do the roofs. So you didn't have to have super skilled craftsmen and you could do it fast. So that's the, this is the other side of Woodward, by the way. There's Woodward right down there in the corner. And these are the farms. So they bought up the farms on either side of Woodward. And this is the 1921 Sanborn map where you've already got some homes platted on there, or you've already got some homes sold on there showing. Um, this is what Eco City looked like. The lots were much smaller, of course, than in, um, Court and Lakes, less expensive. Um, I thought this was neat. This is um, a from a national magazine, and Herbert Hoover, the president, was really pushing 
people buying, the middle class, the working class buying homes, buying single family homes, getting out of the city, getting in the healthy, fresh air with their families, whole thing, home buying. So you see over on the left, this apartment building and the sign says, no children wanted. And then over on the far right, there's this idyllic suburban home with the kids running around. And in the middle is Uncle Sam. So an Uncle Sam is pointing over there and saying, you know, this is, this is the way to go. Let's do this. And th this, is, this is Eco City. This is their e office on Woodward. And these are their salesmen, uh, which are, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, the idea was you could go walk around the um, lots um, and there would be posts with uh, tags on them. And if you found the lot you wanted, you tore off a tag and you walked over to the office on Woodward and to discuss finances and to look at the models. And, you know, if you could afford to pick a model and, and have them build it for you, the prices were very moderate. Um, and, and you could do that. So this is, a, this is an ad for it. It says as low as, lots as low as 495. And then down below it says, better to put, invest your money in land than landlords. So you can see the target audience for this is very different than the target audience for Port and Lake Estates. And one thing I completely forgot to talk about when I was talking about Court and Lakes were the deed restrictions. Um, in Court and Lakes, um, you had to build houses that were of a certain, cost a certain amount of money. If you had a house on Lake Park or Lake View, it, in 1925, you had to at least spend $9,500 to build it. Um, if you were on Puritan or Pilgrim, it had to be $8,500. If you were on some of the other streets, $7,500. Um, so there was a limit. You couldn't build a cheap house. And at that time, the average cost of a house in the US was about three and a half, four thousand. 4000 So they were asking you to build a nice house. Here, um, there were no limits. Uh, in fact, here's another ad. What they're, what they're pushing here is, you know, you're right between Pontiac and Detroit. So what a perfect place to live if you're, and commute on the DUR. You don't need a car. You can use the DUR. You can get to, to the auto plants. Um, in one article in the eccentric Leinbach and uh, Humphrey said that three quarters of the people that they had sold houses to in uh, Eco City were Ford motor workers, Ford workers. I don't know if that's true. It sounds really high, but they could go to Highland Park. Here's two of the models you could buy. I know. These are the minimum. These are bottom of the barrel models, I think. You could buy them finished or unfinished. It's the Eco and the Woodward model. They were four rooms with two closets. No baths. No baths. No baths. <laughs> You had a privy. <laughs> um, and the thing is, in the 20s, there weren't uh, much, many building codes. There weren't zoning codes. It was kind of the Wild West. Now, Birmingham in the 20s is when it developed its building codes, its zoning codes, its planning commission. All of those things came in the 20s. But right at the beginning, they didn't have any of that. So one of the things I read, which was a little horrifying in the eccentric, was um, there were some people complaining after the first year or two of Eco City because apparently they let people buy lots and build garages and live in the garages. And they could live in the garage for up to three years until they were able to build their house. And then they were supposed to move the garage to the back of the lot. Yeah, was common. was common. Yeah, that's, you know. When did Eco City change its name? To, to Birmingham? Well, did they just well I'll, yeah, I'll tell you in a minute. When they annexed, but it wasn't, it was a little controversial. I thought myself, this is Ruffner. This is what Ruffner looked like, if any of you been down Ruffner now. Oh, and by the way, the, the streets were named after the families. Humphrey is Humphrey. 
Chapin is the son of Mr. Humphrey. Benneville's the son of Mr. Humphrey. Ruffner was his wife's maiden name. So they're all family names. But yeah, this was Ruffner in the 20s. And you can see the kind of assembly line feel that has. You know, how you could build those houses quickly. Um, one of the things that happened on Ruffner was that in 1925 there was a typhoid outbreak at Pierce School, which was opened in 1925. And it was blamed on 15 houses on Ruffner that had privies. And they thought, that the, the paper thought, the town fathers thought in Birmingham that it was the poor sanitary conditions um, that were causing that. However, um, Ruffner was exonerated and they found that the water was from another source they were using for construction. But Bloomfield Township, which is, because they weren't part of Birmingham yet, they were just part of Bloomfield Township. Bloomfield Township then required all houses in Eco City to have indoor plumbing. And if, if they couldn't afford to put indoor plumbing in, the township was gonna help them do it, provide some, some money to do it. So that was a, that was a change. This is that st what that street looks like today. And you can see the, the couple houses we tried, my husband tried to get, we tried to get maybe, maybe this is where it really was. And those first two could go back to the 20s. Yeah, there's only three houses on that entire street on the north, north side of the street that still have any of the original character. All the rest are two stories or more. So then you can see a whole row of new ones. Could you repeat what he said so everyone can that um, there were only, are only three houses on that street that are look like they're from the 20s. The rest are all quite new, which is, you know, a really kind of different thing than in Corton Lake Estates. But that's understandable because these really weren't built as well, these houses. Although, on the other hand, there's really still quite a few of them if you go through the whole neighborhood. And some of them have been maintained really well. And the other thing is, this is on Bird, that not all the houses were like those little ones. You could buy a lot and build a house, or they also had models that were two-story, models with bathrooms, models with, um, you know, nice, much nicer models. And so these were there in the 20s. The one in the middle, the Dutch Colonial, that was where Mr. Joy, who was the superintendent of Eco City, that's where he lived. And this is today, still there. Those two and that third one that's not in the picture here are all still there. And then there's some new ones. So. What street is that? That's Bird, yeah. One of the, uh, but what happened, you were asking about the, how they got to be. I, I had this assumption that Eco City sounded kind of pejorative to me you know, economic city, that if I were going to move into a house, I wouldn't maybe be think that was the coolest name of my subdivision. But the people in Eco City developed a really strong sense of community. And they called themselves Ecoites. And, and they had a civic association. They had clubs. They had the Eco City News in the eccentric, their own section, where they would talk about their dinner parties and things. And they, um, they were not at all sure they wanted to be part of Birmingham. Um, and a main reason, of course, was they didn't want to pay the taxes. Um, but what happened is Bloomfield Township wasn't so thrilled having Eco City there either because <laughs> by 1924, there were like 200 families living here. And they had, you know, like, um, 800 people, or you know, it was 12, no, 1,200 people living in Eco City. So, and they were hard, you know, they wanted, they wanted stuff. They wanted their sidewalks repaired, they wanted their streets fixed, they wanted the, the street lights, they wanted all the things that naturally you would want if you were in a community. Well, Bloomfield Hills, Bloomfield Township said, you know, we didn't sign up for this. This is uh, Linebach Humphrey's problem. They built the subdivision, let them take care of it. Leinbach Humphrey said, um, but we really think Birmingham 
we really think it'd be a good idea to annex to Birmingham. And the people that lived there were kind of on both sides of the issue. And um, they thought the people in Birmingham were kind of old fogies. That was one of the things. On the other hand, there was a, a little thing in the uh, eccentric uh, where somebody wrote in, a, some Birmingham person wrote in and referred to Eco City as a slum. The next paper, George Averill, who was the editor, wrote in and sa wrote a column and said, I'm so sorry that this slipped by. This is, this is just terrible. This is not true. The people of Eco City are the salt of the earth. So um, ultimately, in 1926, um, they, there was a vote. Birmingham voted, Eco City voted, Bloomfield Township, everybody voted. Um, Eco City um, was annexed into Birmingham. Um, now, Court and Lake Estates was annexed in 1922. They were the very first um, piece of land to be annexed beyond the original 460 acres of Birmingham. And Birmingham couldn't have been happier to annex them, um, really. <laughs> They said, it actually said in the paper that the first year they were annexed, they made $5,000 extra taxes off of Court and Lake Estates. Court and Lake Estates was happy to be part of Birmingham, and they wanted to hook up with their water system and their sewer system and everything. Um, but was, what was interesting, and this is the last thing I'll say because I know the time is, um, what was interesting, it gave, it, it told me something, when they had the vote, they actually lost the first time. But um, what it was is because the people in Bloomfield Township, it, you had to have a majority of people in Birmingham who wanted Port and Lakes to be annexed, a majority of people in Bloomfield Township, and a majority of people in the Court and Lakes estate. That was the deal. And if they all had a majority, it would be annexed. Well, Bloomfield Township did not have a majority. Um, but it turned out the reason they didn't have a majority was because they thought they were going to lose the taxes. But they didn't lose the taxes. It's really just that Birmingham gained taxes. Um, and so they, the, the can, board of canvassers decided in their wisdom that Birmingham and Bloomfield Township really counted as the same thing. So if you added those two groups of voters together, it worked out. You had a majority. So, um, so that worked. But the other interesting thing about that is that the people who voted from Court and Lakes Estate, this is 1922, were six, five, four, and one against, which just suggests that at that time, still in 1922, there, were, there was very slow development in Court and Lake Estates. There were not a lot of houses. People remember living on a street like Puritan and there only being two or three houses on the street. It was very slow. On the other hand, in that, where, where there was an article in the Eccentric in 22 that said four houses are being started in Court and Lakes, the same year, the same month in the paper, there was an article that said a um, hundred houses are now in Eco City and 400 people. So just it was the difference in the way those two areas developed. But today we have them both. They're both vital parts of our community. And um, I'm, I'm going to stop at that. So.